This is Dave Meltzer with Entrepreneurs the Playbook, and I have an incredible entrepreneur who would have ever thought probably one of the most powerful people in sports. He also hooks up on a show with my boy Gary. Matt Kalis, co-founder and president of DraftKings. Welcome to the Playbook. Hey, Dave. How are you? I'm so well. Thank you so much for doing this. I just, you know, have been involved in sports for so long. And every time I go into a stadium or arena like this one, and I see your brand planted everywhere and millions and millions of people participating in your solution, I pinch myself because, you know, I was a Pete Rose fan and, you know, they kept him out of baseball. I never thought in a million years that we'd be able to not only participate in all the great things that DraftKings does, but promote it within sports. For you and in, in your perspective in business of sports, did you ever dream that the adoption would be so uh, massive and so quick? Well, 10 years ago, things were a lot different in the U.S. if you're a sports fan. Really, just in the U.S., there's a lot of countries where, you know, for many decades, uh, Australia, U.K., Ireland, you name it, much of Europe, you know, sports betting has been legal, regulated, and a huge part of the culture of being a sports fan, you know, for most of the world. In the U.S., though, 10 years ago, there really wasn't a lot of ways that fans could really jump in and predict things or compete with friends, play along with the games that they loved. Uh, things like ESPN season long, maybe you had an office pool that you were doing, um, you know, like a March Madness bracket, but there wasn't a ton going on, and it was a little unfortunate to be a sports fan in the U.S., and a lot of people were also driven to offshore sports books that weren't regulated, didn't have a lot of consumer protection. So DraftKings over the last, you know, nine, almost 10 years now, starting with daily fantasy sports in 2012, uh, and now more recently with sports betting, really where we've been focused is bringing to the U.S. like a mainstream adoption of, you know, more options for a skin in the game sports fan. And, you know, through that evolution, our own personal journeys. I personally went from the corporate world as a lawyer, working for a large company of legal publisher into sports with uh, running the most notable sports agency in the world, Lee Steinberg. Uh, that entrepreneurial journey uh, through technology and sports took a lot of courage because you know there's a lot of people out there when you're in the corporate world and you come up with these sports related dreams, think that it's more about the sports than the business. And you came out of the corporate world and launched DraftKings with your friends and co-founders. What was some of the resistance? I always say that people laugh at you, scoff at you and make fun of you when they're jealous of you uh, pursuing a dream. What were some of the uh, resistance that you uh, faced as you went through this entrepreneurial journey coming out of the corporate world into the romantic world, the exciting world of sports? Well, you know, what we brought to the table as a founding team, you know, myself, Jason Robbins, who is our CEO today, and Paul Lieberman, you know, we all worked together seven or eight years in corporate America, and we were experts at digital marketing, at analytics, and we were also giant, you know, sports fans, we were playing poker, we really were the customer for the type of product we wanted to build. And, you know, still, we went out on the market and pitched our business to 40 VCs, and the first 39 were no. And then Ryan Moore uh, at Atlas was the yes, you know, our 40th probably pitch. That's a rough number, you know, not, I'm not literally saying 40, but, you know, we heard no for months. And I would say it came down to a lot of reasons, but in general, it's two things. Like, first is people are really resistant to lead anything. You know, it's always hard to get the first, you know, the lead investor on board. And then the second thing is, I think there's a lot of question about the regulatory, you know, like, is this a team that, you know, builds something great, but the regulatory process is slow or like things don't really open up as much as, you know, what we, what we thought might happen over time. And, you know, that's always a risk. And I think people were looking at markets like poker, where for years people were trying to get poker regulated. And there was maybe one or two states at the time that actually did it. You know, it was Nevada, New Jersey, you know, very slow progress. And so there's a lot of uh, question about what that landscape would look like. And it made the upside, I think, look less appealing. You know, as much as you had the skills and the knowledge, which I always say, you know, really determine your basement. And you guys had high skill and knowledge 
in digital marketing, analytics, et cetera, which was necessary for your success. It's really the people uh, from your original funding all the way through today, you have extraordinary people working with you and people are so essential to, especially a company like yours, but we're faced with great challenges today uh, in the recruitment and retention of people. And so many people would love to come to work with uh, DraftKings. So many people would love to associate themselves with it. What are some of the hiring practices or the potential identificator, identification uh, techniques that you utilize because as much as the skills and knowledge are a basement, we both know it's the desire that determines our ceiling. And you guys seem to have hired people with very high basements, but even higher ceilings. Yeah. I mean, early on, we were bringing on very high confidence people from our immediate network that we knew were believers that were passionate about the business that we were building. I would say our first, you know, 20 employees, a lot of them were from companies that we had worked at and specifically like the people that we worked closely with, you know, at Capital One, at Vistaprint, you know, the predecessor companies that we were at. And then once we got to more scale, like DraftKings has 3000 employees now. So we're at a pretty large scale. And there's a couple of fundamentals that really, you know, have underpinned how we thought about talent. You know, first is we want everybody to act like an owner of the company, you know, act like an owner is what we say. And to do that, first, we look for that mentality in the hiring process, but then we also give every single employee equity. So there's not a single, you know, staff member that doesn't have shares of DraftKings. And so finding that sort of bias towards acting like an owner um, and then also just paying it off with skin in the game for our employees has been a big part. And then we're also really selective in the interview process. Like last year we looked, I haven't looked at the final number for 2021, but last year we had over 40,000 applications and we hired under a thousand people. So we had, you know, very selective rate and, you know, our hiring process is difficult, but if you get through, um, you're pretty, you're, you're strong. You're a good candidate for the job most often. And, you know, that resilience that it takes to make it through that process of one in 40 uh, is also indicative of the culture, of the ethos of your brand, this resilient brand as well that has gone through as, you know, different state laws have changed, the federal government, different challenges, different changes. And any technology-based company, you know, has to face change at an amazing exponential rate. How important is resilience in your own personal journey, but also the resilience of the company as you guys have grown exponentially during the greatest time of uncertainty. Any company around 10 years is gonna go through cycles. You know, there'll be times when people think DraftKings is the greatest company in the world and like literally the best idea ever. And then people will think your company sucks the next day and then they'll think it's the best thing ever. And, you know, it's very cyclical. We've been through a bunch of different cycles and we've hit, you know, numerous headwinds. Like, as you mentioned, we went through, you know, the process of an industry that wasn't regulated with fantasy sports into regulation, you know, and everything that that entailed, government affairs, compliance, legal, regulatory, all these teams we never had, you know, going from being a relatively low part of our focus to like everything that we were doing in 2016. You know, and then the launch of sports betting, where we went from spending no time on sports betting to that's everything we're doing, you know, dealing with whatever the, the kind of situation or the cycle of the day is. And, you know, having a clear sense of who our customer is, what we're trying to do to serve them, and, you know, letting that drive our roadmap and what we do has really been the one thing that's been stable. You know, we have this idea that there's tens of millions of people in the U.S. who kind of like, you know, me, they don't want to just sit and watch the game. They want to play. They want to predict things. They want to, you know, compete with their friends. They like having some skin in the game when they're watching, you know, and we think that there's a lot of people like that out there and wherever the attention of that fan goes, that's what we want to be building, whether it's fantasy sports betting, or even now with crypto NFTs kind of move where the attention's going of our audience. And that's been the one thing that's given us stability, even though, you know, there's a lot of cycles a lot of ups and downs. One of the thing about my entrepreneurial journey it has had its ups and downs as well, is I always wonder if I had to go back and, and if I knew when I started what I would have to do to get to the point where I have this incredible 
office at this incredible stadium with this incredible podcast with these incredible people. I wonder if I actually would have went forward in doing so, uh, knowing what I had to go through looking back. What advice would you give? Because you've had a similar journey. It's been forged with resilience and consistent behavior, kindness, lessons, all the different things that it takes. You know, number one, looking backwards, if you knew what you had to do to get to you where you are today, would you do it? And two, what advice would you give to a budding entrepreneur starting out? I mean, I don't know if I would do it again personally, but like, I, I think it, <laughs> uh, it's really formative in your life. You're an I honest mean, man. Look, I, I just turned 40 and everybody was asking me when I turned 40 there, you know, like, do you feel old or do you wish you could go back in time? And like, if you could be 20 again, would you do it? And I'm like, hell no. Like I put in those de like decades of work, you know, year after year at DraftKings, working, you know, 14, 15, whatever hours a day, just grinding, building, you know, and it was incredibly rewarding, an amazing experience. It was also very, very hard work. And I think everybody should go through something like that, you know, whatever their version of that is. Maybe you're serving in the military, maybe you're building a company, maybe it's a family thing, whatever. Like whatever you're doing that give you that, you know, experience that you can look back on and be like, that was really hard, but also extremely rewarding. And it's kind of like the legacy. Yeah, I think everyone should do that. But I can't say I would like go back and really love, you know, that's hard work and building anything special, I think is really, really hard work. And, you know, I would never want to minimize like the amount of commitment that it takes to build something 10 years, you know, go in 10 years and keep building and building and stick to it no matter what comes up you know it's a very difficult work yeah the lessons of patience reconciled with persistence is a difficult one to ascertain especially when you're in the sports world because you love sports which gives you a competitive nature that does not lend itself to being as patient as necessary speaking about though the community that you built obviously crypto and nfts play an integral role within the context of what you're doing in the community that you serve. Um, for you, how has uh, the popularity and interest in crypto and NFT helped expand the business in the marketplace for DraftKings? Well, I don't think anybody knows exactly what the future will look like, but I'm pretty sure that it will include some version of what today is being called Web3 or blockchain technology. A lot of what's being the innovation, a lot of what's being explored right now, I think will reshape everything from gameplay, collectibles, um, even the way people think about like finance, investment, et cetera. Like a lot of these concepts are really going from a, a traditional version to something that's much more disruptive through a lot of this decentralized blockchain tech. And it's unlocking a lot of creativity and it's also taking a lot of attention from you know, what I think is the core audience of DraftKings, myself included, you know, I've dove in headfirst into everything from NFT, crypto, you know, um, yield farming, everything. I feel like I went from zero to being maybe like, to, I'm not saying like top expert in this, but I've learned a lot in the last year. And what I've learned is really like, I think digital collectibles are going to be very disruptive. I think this as a form of engagement for anybody who's like a skin in the game fan who's looking for kind of um, risk reward propositions, this is going to be something that's engaging for a long time. And it's going to be part of DraftKings future as well. And I think we've shown that already by building DraftKings marketplace by you know our relationship with Autograph, which is Tom Brady's NFT company and bringing to market you know, some really new digital collectibles to our audience and seeing how well that's been received. And, you know, our recent deal that we announced with the NFL PA, where we're going to be doing a lot of utility based NFTs together, gameplay, et cetera. So it's going to be a big part of our future. And I think we know some of what that will look like now. And some of it, I think, is going to be to be seen in terms of where the future kind of shapes up. One of the other changes that you and I parallel, uh, you have an unbelievable podcast with my boy, Gary V, Props and Drops. It's, you know, all just real. That's the way I say it. But part of being real on that show is something that I had difficulty coming, once again, from a more corporate, private. I was, you know, 
Lee Steinberg's guy, Warren Moon's partner. I was, nobody knew who I was. I could do whatever I wanted. Uh, but once you have the popularity of doing anything with Gary, especially, you now have to share some of your personal life. Uh, and there is a transition there. You know, what has been the challenge or the positive side of being able to share your per personal authenticity, your frequency, your own personal brand beyond just being the catalyst and the empowerment superpower that you are, you now are a brand, you know, for you, what has that meant? And are there any challenges that are involved? Yeah, I mean, look, I'm pretty introverted in general. I'd never want to be the center of attention on anything. And anybody who knows me well would tell you that, you know, I, I'm like somebody that will like leave a party without saying goodbye to people and just like duck out the side door early you know i'm not looking for attention or anything like that right and the situation we kind of found ourselves in i think at DraftKings was you know the company was growing so fast it was becoming larger and larger and we were playing in more spaces and uh i lead our marketing team and i kind of had this realization like DraftKings is literally just a company of people who are just like our, our consumer, our target audience. I'm doing all of this stuff. Like behind me, I have, you know, sealed cards. I have these things. I'm just all during COVID, right? I'm just on eBay buying collectibles. I'm playing fantasy every weekend. Love going to Vegas, love sports betting. It's a huge part of my life. And I think there's a real like sort of authenticity about who I actually am as a person, what I like to do, the type of people I surround myself with, my hobbies. It's not different than, you know, I'm not different than our audience, right? And so being able to show that side of the company, I think was something that was appealing to me and make that connection with, you know, the millions of people that we're serving. And I think Gary is somebody very similar. I found a lot of common ground with him right away. You know, we share a lot of hobbies we're both trying to build great companies, but also, you know, on the side, we like even the, the small games, you know, like, can I find an arbitrage on something on eBay? He likes to go to yard sales even and find like something he can buy for $10 and sell for $30 just to like play the game, you know? And so I found a lot of common ground with Gary and I thought that we were able to introduce content in a space like NFTs that was so emerging and new and there wasn't a lot of mainstream content out there. So it just checked a lot of boxes for me and I was open to trying it and doing it. And, you know, since starting, I've been more comfortable, you know, now I'm more comfortable doing podcasts. I feel a little bit better being out there, but it's the last thing I thought I would be doing in January if you asked me. Well, I'll tell you what, Thinking about those synergies, there was no doubt when you were close to Gary that I knew you were someone that I would enjoy being with. I thought maybe you and I could go to a game together, but I think maybe Vegas would be the better spot for you and I to meet, hearing what your interests are. And one of the things I've learned about Gary is not only does he love the arbitrage, but now he's powerful enough to be a market maker, uh, which is an interesting aspect of working with Gary that I love is understanding how he can move a market especially in a more closed market with tighter hands. He's an expert at it. Uh, and NFTs is one of those areas that I follow him closely. A genius like you, thank you so much for everything you've taught us and how to follow our passions and be consistent and persistent in that pursuit of our potential. Just a simple guy who took what he loved and turned it into one of the greatest companies here and around the world. Matt, thanks so much for joining me.